Hello, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast, episode three. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, and you can find me online at the Dark Matter darkmatterknits.com, which is the website for um, the podcast and a number of other things that I do. And um, you can also find me on Ravelry as Elizabeth GM and on Twitter as Dark Matter Knits. And there's also a Ravel, or Ravelry group called Dark Matter Knits Fans that you're welcome to come and discuss episodes, find show notes, um, ask any questions that you want to ask. So please come and join us. I... Um, if you haven't watched the podcast up until now, I'll tell you that the podcast episodes each focus on a particular theme. So the theme for today, as you can see in the title of the episode, is quiet. Now, the reason I decided to do this was that, you know, each, every couple of weeks as I record an episode, I try to think about, you know, what is the theme that kind of pulls together a few things that I've been thinking about or working on in knitting and spinning over that couple of weeks. And this really seem to capture a lot of what I was thinking about and doing. Um, partly based on a book that I've been listening to called Quiet. You may have heard of this book. It, it came out, I believe, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the audiobook version. And the subtitle is The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And it's written by Susan Cain. It's been on the bestseller list for a while. Um, it's, it's really nicely read. I think the person they chose for this is has a really appropriate voice. Her name is Kathy Kath Kath Kathy Mazur. Um I haven't seen any of the shows that she's on, but I guess she's on a lot of shows that you might have seen like The Closer, Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, etc. So um yeah, so listening to this book, I'll I'll talk quite a bit about this book today because it's it's really interesting to me. Uh partly because I am an introvert, which <laughs> might surprise you. <laughs> Why would an introvert do a podcast? But we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and I also, the other reason I thought this would be an interesting theme to talk about was that while I was listening to this book, I was going up to and coming back from a knitting and spinning, well, really a fiber retreat, the Texas Winter Fiber Fun Retreat, I believe it's called. And it's up in Denton, Texas, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And um, the, the whole irony of listening to a book about introversion and being on your own and being quiet as I was going to and coming from a complete immersion in other knitters and spinners, very little alone time, <laughs> was um, the, the irony was not lost on me. And it, so it just got me thinking about, you know, how is a retreat really quiet time? In what sense is it really that... And in what sense does it really tax one's ability to kind of, kind of tax one's social reserves? If you're the kind of person like me who uh, really loves social time, but kind of needs some time to yourself mixed in with that. Um, how do you deal with a retreat, which really isn't ultimately very quiet at all? So let me just tell you a little bit about the book first, and then I will... Um, get to how I think it kind of ties in in some interesting ways with being a knitter and a spinner and particularly being one at a retreat. Um, the book is really, really interesting. I, uh, I actually got it. This was so great. I got this in as part of a, a goodie bag at TNNA, the National Needle Arts Association meeting in June, a couple of years ago. And it was, um, at the designer dinner hosted by Marley Bird. Uh, this was the there were audiobooks in each one of the, the goodie bags, and this was the one in mine. And I opened it up, and it was, like, it was one of the things I was most excited about. You know, there's all this lovely yarn and stitch markers and bags and all this stuff. And I'm like, ooh, audiobook, squee! Because <laughs> I'd been wanting to read this, and so, you know, here it is. And, um, and so I just used the excuse of having this long trip to, you know, finally start listening to it. And it's fascinating. I mean, basically her whole point is that... Uh, a lot of American culture is organized around uh, celebrating the qualities tied to extroversion. Um, that, for example, in business, we have uh, moved toward more open floor plans, you know, where people don't have private offices anymore or even private cubicles. The belief being that group work and intensive interaction is really the best way to come up with new creative ideas and promote 
efficiency. And, um, and she argues that even if it's not the ex even if that sometimes helps, if sometimes teamwork and open office plans can promote some kind of work activity, that actually when you look at a lot of uh, the, many of the kinds of tasks that people are being asked to do at work, they do their best work when they're alone and uninterrupted. And that this is particularly true for introverts, that they can't handle all of that stimulation, you know, other people talking around them and interrupting them and, uh, you know, the sights and sounds of a busy open office can be incredibly distracting, particularly to introverts who do their best work when they're alone and uninterrupted. So, and she makes this point too about schools that education has really moved much toward, much more toward uh, group work and kids sitting in desks facing each other instead of working on their own. I mean, of course they still work on their own, but you know, not as, not as frequently as they used to. And that kids are really encouraged to, you know, not be shy and to speak out for themselves in class. And while this is valuable, in fact, as a teacher, I did exactly the same thing. It was really thought provoking to think about, you know, should we always be pushing kids to, to be more extroverted than they really are? I mean, perhaps the better plan with both kids and adults, right, would be to kind of find their strengths and play those up as much as possible while still, you know, kind of stretching them in new directions. I mean, you don't just want to cultivate introverts and extroverts in opposite directions, but solitary, intensive, contemplative work is just as valuable in education as um, interactive, social, communicating type work is. Um, and she talks about how, you know, a kind of overemphasis on extroversion helped contribute to the stock market and the housing crashes in the last decade. Um, how evangelical churches tend to sort of overemphasize extroversion so much so that introverted ministers feel like they're not doing God's work because they're not talking to people all the time. It's really, really fascinating. And I mean, I would say listen to it, especially if you're an introvert, because I think it's largely targeted at introverts. Um, but it's really it would be valuable to listen to for lots of different kinds of people. I mean, I'm actually thinking about sending it to my dad because I mean, he's about, he's way over on the other side, polar side of the spectrum for me. He's very extroverted and, um, but really appreciates introverts. I mean, he married one and he has one as a daughter. <laughs> um, and you know, kind of sees, even though he doesn't really get it sometimes, like, why are you like this? Why are you so risk averse? Why are you, you know, not excited and trying to, you know, why are you trying to pull back on all these things that I'm trying to do? Um, I think this would be a really good way to kind of explain to him, like, here's, here's the way that I think versus the way that youth tend to approach things. And here's why they actually work, they actually work better together. It's good to have some of each in any particular grouping. So uh, it was just, it was a great way to, to pass the time as I was making the long drive from Austin up to, up to Denton for this retreat. And I just got thinking, gosh, you know, it's funny. Like I said, you know, it's funny that I'm listening to this thing about being quiet and alone and introverted and how great that is as I'm going to spend, what was it? I mean, like 72 hours with other knitters and spinners and we're all staying in the same building and you know, you get up and I, and I was rooming with someone, um, whom I just adore. I mean, she's great company. Um, but you know, there basically was not barely a single moment when I was by myself. And, and I also, while I have befriended some of these people, I don't really know any of them extremely well. So there's a lot of time where you're having to, you know, kind of generate conversation. It's, it's just exhausting. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're an introvert, like, it's really fun to talk to people. And it's just you know, like your mind is constantly going. <laughs> so it just and, and I just thought, you know, this is so funny that retreats are considered to be a way to relax and to unwind and to get away from it all. And while there is certainly a huge 
truth to that. You know, I, I rarely get to spend that much uninterrupted time just spinning and knitting, right? And hanging out with other women who do that. It, this was, it was all women as it turned out. Um, at the same time, you know, it's just like to a certain extent, it's, it's still like kind of like work or, or just, just tiring. So, um, I just, I started thinking about that all weekend about, you know, how, in what ways a retreat is really kind of relaxing and exhausting at the same time. And, um, and it got me, it reminded me of when I taught a knitting class at Southwestern, the, the college where I used to teach, I taught a first year seminar on knitting and it was, um, in, in part, I taught them how to knit, but I, we also read a lot about things that had to do with knitting. So we read about, you know, the history of industrialization and um, why handwork has come to be more popular in recent years and the rise of the DIY movement and um, the, the psychological and neuroscientific research showing that uh, activities like knitting promote brain health in older age and, um, you know, just all these different ways that knitting kind of pops up in the scholarly literature. So, but what, why I bring this up is because one of the really interesting things I noticed in this class was that the conversations in that class were completely different than the conversations in any of my other classes. And it wasn't just because of the subject matter, I, I taught history. So, you know, I mean, obviously there's going to be some differences between a discussion of, I don't know, ancient Babylonian mathematics and knitting, <laughs> but it wasn't, so, it wasn't that it was more the quality of the conversation was really different. And I realized it was because people were knitting in class and it just took the edge off somehow. It was really interesting. So one of the things that would happen was that, you know, in my other classes, I had students who would talk all the time, you know, who were always eager and informed participants in discussion. I also had eager and uninformed <laughs> participants in discussion, uh, but, you know, there were the ones who always talked. And then there were the ones who would occasionally talk. And then the ones who would never talk. And there was very little I could do to disrupt those categories. You know, there wasn't much that was going to get the never talkers to talk. But in the knitting class, everybody talked. Everybody. And, and not just in irrelevant ways, but like, you know, interesting, relevant stuff. And, um, and I was trying to figure out, you know, why is that? Because the, the people who never talked in my other classes would always tell me it was because they were too shy, that they were worried about other people thinking they were stupid, or they were worried they were going to say something that somebody had already said, or, you know, they were just anxious about talking in front of other people. And, um, but I think what happened with the knitting was that because they had something in their hands that they could look at without seeming rude, right? They, they had something that they could kind of look down at and therefore, you know, kind of close off from their consciousness the fact that everybody was looking at them. You know, they could just kind of focus down here, but talk at the same time. Um, I think that kind of helped take some of the edge off of the anxiety of, of speaking in front of other people. And, um, and I think it also, you know, you know this from doing these crafts yourselves that there's there's something about doing them that kind of calms your lizard brain <laughs> you know that part of your brain that's like I need to get up I need to go do something I need to be productive doing something else I need to blah, 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 blah. that little twitchy part of your brain that just can't relax will relax often when you're when you're doing a craft like that and so I think it just kind of put a low level hum on the class that allowed people to just speak from a calmer place. And, um, and, and it, it, to the point where they would even, there would be spontaneous discussions that would start without me over in the corner. You know, there'd be like three people that would start talking about something and they weren't talking about what they were going to do for the weekend. They were talking about the material for the class. You know, it was, it was, fascinating. I have never had that happen in any other class that I taught. So, um, yeah, it just, I realized that 
going back to the retreat situation, that even for somebody who's introverted, a knitting and spinning retreat is the fact that it's about knitting and spinning and that you have those crafts to occupy your hands and part of your brain while you're there takes some of the edge off of that constant social time that can be so exhausting. Um, and I definitely found that to be true, that, you know, I noticed, I was very hyper aware of the fact that many other people at that retreat were also introverted and um, that we could just sit there and spin or knit and there didn't have to constantly be conversation filling in all of those moments of silence that we could just sit there happily working on these things together and um so yeah it just it made it feel a lot more relaxing than i think i would feel otherwise if i were just constantly in other people's presence um so let me show you what i've what i worked on while i was there and what i've been working on the last couple of weeks in my in my so-called quiet time at the retreat um you may remember last time if you saw episode two that uh sorry i'm trying to get this bag open that i was spinning again for the first time in a really long time and uh and i finished spinning the the braid that i was working on last time the highland handmaid's braid and i actually have very little of the yarn left because not only did i finish spinning it but i also um started knitting it and uh so <laughs> here's one of the little bits that i have left this is again uh, Highland Handmaids 100% Superwash BFL. It's um, I, I actually talked to her after I recorded that last episode, and she said, "Oh my God, I can't believe that label. That was from years ago." So apparently, this was one of from one of the early years that she was dying, and uh, she did, it's this beautiful combination of purples and and yellow. Um, and it, I have no idea how many wraps per inch this is. I don't have a wraps per inch tool. I suppose I could just use a ruler, but I don't, I need to look up how to actually measure that accurately. But I'm knitting it on a size 2.5 mil or two and a half, US two and a half needle, which is, um, let's see what size that is in millimeters. Um, it's a, what is that? Oh, it's a three millimeter needle. So, I guess it's a sport weight for the most part. It's a little thick and thin, so, you know, it varies. But here is what I've been making with it. And, um, in fact, I think I was wearing this hat last time, so we'll take that off and put this hat on. Um, so I made it kind of slouchy. So I can look like a turbo dork with it up like this. Or, by the way, would you like to know how to put on a slouchy hat? <laughs> I think some people don't really know how to do this. You put on, I had one of my students teach me because she made me a hat like this. First time I had a slouchy hat and I put it on like this, you know, like giant mushroom on the top. And she's like, Dr. GM, that's not how you wear a slouchy hat. So she showed me how to do it because, you know, I'm a dork. So you, what you do is you put the hat on, you let all of the, the bulky stuff, you know, the rest of the hat puff up on top. And then you just grab it kind of right back here like this and pull all that excess down, kind of fold over a little flap like that. And um, I mean, you, I guess you could have it sticking up straight off your head, it's your prerogative, but I think it looks silly that way. So I made a hat and I made a mitt. I didn't have, I wanted actually to make mittens, but I didn't have quite enough. So I made just some very plain, just like the hat, very plain fingerless mitts. I didn't follow a pattern. I just kind of made it up as I went along. I've knit enough mitts and hats to know what the basic drill is. Um, and I'm this far into the second mitt. I am so excited. I am so excited to have not only finished something, but to actually have started knitting something out of it that I really, really like. I think I'll leave the hat on because my hair looks a mess. Uh, I ended up getting, um, what would this be added up? 350 yards. So yeah, that's probably somewhere between a, it's probably a heavy fingering weight or a sport. 
Um, and I so goofed the whole uh, spinning them up into equal halves. I, I two plied them. So um, I had like a, the, a larger skein that was 266 yards that I, you know, plied off of the two bobbins. And then I had 84 yards left on the larger of the two bobbins that I just split up into two uh, cakes and, and uh, plied together. But it worked out fine. I used that smaller one to to do uh, one of the mitts and the larger one to do the hat and the other mitt. So no problem. And then, um, so what that means that I'm kind of running out of fiber. Eek! I'm in no danger of running out of yarn. However, I didn't really have much fiber left. So hmm, the fiber retreat, I got some fiber. And I got it all from this woman. Oh, it's going to be all washed out. Can I get, ah, there we go. So there's her little card. Hopefully you can read that. I'll read it to you just in case that wasn't very clear. Uh, the business is called Wooden Spinner Fibers. Wooden Spinner, as one word, fibers, by Brenda, Brenda Harrower, and she's in, based in Vicksburg, Mississippi. She was at the retreat, and um, it's a lovely person, a very, uh, very talented spinner as well. She gave me a lot of, she really helped me out a lot while I was spinning, because I was just goofing up right and left. Um, but she made, makes these really cool bats. Uh, this one is Merino, Silk Noil, and Angelina. So the Merino is the background, and then the Silk Noil are these really cool, crazy bits of color. And then what you may not really be able to see, oh, now you can see it, are little bits of sparkle that are the Angelina. Ooh, there's a great part. Wah! I love warm colors. This is a favorite. And then I got another one of those, but in blue, it's not nearly as bright as it's showing up on the screen. It's more of a, more gray blue than this. And um, got this to, I'm gonna spin them each separately onto bobbins and then ply them together. And this one's actually a different fiber, but it's the same, uh, same weight. So I'm hoping it'll work out okay. Uh, this one is Coriadale Silk, Sorry Silk, and Angora. Mm. She was selling them all half off. I got these three for 20 bucks. These things are beautiful. I saw some of it spun up too. It's really nice. It's going to be fun to spin with. I haven't spun stuff with bits in it like that before, so it should be really, really exciting. Um, the last thing I guess I want to talk with you all about this week um, is about, I was trying to think, you know, what would be a good technique? Because I always like to do a little technique at the end. What would be a good technique to talk about that ties in with this theme of, of quiet and introversion and um, getting distracted and trying to get in situations where you're not distracted? So I was thinking that it would be a good idea to talk about something that I get asked about a lot, especially by beginner and kind of intermediate knitter, knitters which is um, how do you tell, if you get distracted from your knitting, how do you tell where you were when you come back to it? Like, let's say you're sitting there knitting and you start talking and you lose track of where you were or the phone rings or, you know, your cat jumps on your face or <laughs> I don't know, something like that. It happens to all of us, right? And you pick up your knitting and you think, uh oh, I don't know where I was. So a couple of ideas about that. And one of the main things that I often mention to people when they're kind of freaking out about like, how do I know where I was? One of the main things that you want to be aware of is that when you're knitting, um, the working yarn, the yarn that you're actually using to wrap or that you're picking from, if you're a continental knitter, that is always coming out of the last stitch that you worked. So actually, when I picked this up just now, it had flipped. It's been a while since I've worked on this, and it had flipped inside out. And um, and I was looking at it, and I was thinking, well, that's weird, because the yarn is coming out of this stitch, but that's on the left-hand needle. Like if I pull the yarn to the front, you can see, like, why is the, the last stitch that I worked on the left-hand needle? And I thought, oh, it's flipped inside out. 
if I flip it back again to this side, now the last stitch I worked is on the right hand needle where it belongs. So that it can really help you orient yourself to where you last were and what you need to do next. And, um, and I'm sorry if this is obvious to some of you who have been doing this for a while, but I think these are really kind of unstated rules that often don't get talked about in beginner knitter classes. Um, another thing you can look for is, uh, and this is it's people often refer to reading your knitting, and um, you may not, you know, really like how do you read your knitting, and that what they're talking about is being able to understand by looking at what you've already knit, and using that to understand what you're supposed to do next. Being able to see on your knitting what you've already done. So one of the things to look for, uh, just a really simple thing, is that if you see a bump, this one's probably a little easier to see, if you see a bump underneath your the stitch that's on the needle, that was purled on the previous round or row. On the other hand, if you see directly underneath the stitch on the needle, a little V like this, that means that stitch was knit on the previous row. And by the way, I mean, a good way of thinking about knitting and knitted and purl stitches is that they're, they're mirror images of each other, right? Or they're just the back and the front of the same stitch. What looks like a V on one side looks like a bump on the other. And I like to explain these when I'm teaching a beginner knitter class as being like a v-neck t-shirt or sweater that the, um, I'm not wearing a v-neck, but let's just kind of pretend it is. Um, this is a knit stitch, the front. It looks like at the front of a v-neck sweater. And then the back of the knit stitch, or the back of the knit stitch, or the, the purl side, is like, is like the back of your collar. So that's, that's one way of kind of thinking about it. Um, if you see something like this over your needle, that's a yarn over. You may not have done it on purpose. <laughs> Hopefully you did, but that's what that is when it's just kind of lying over your needle like that and there's a big hole underneath. Um, how do you count how many rows you've done? So here's another, another one. How many rows have I done since this yarn over? I'll show you how to count. It's really easy. You start just above it and you count all of the stitches, but you don't count the one on the needle. So if I'm counting from, say, let's say this, this yarn over. Well, let's make it this one because that's a little easier for you to see. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've worked seven rounds since that above that yarn over. And you can do, similarly count from things like, um, you know, increases or decreases like on a sleeve or something. Um, you always count the rows that you see, but don't count these on the needle. Those, those you don't actually include in the count. Uh, the last thing I'll recommend is that uh, if you're working from a chart or even just working from regular written instructions, um, it's a really good idea to use something like highlighter tape, um, which is basically just comes on a tape roll and it uh, it's tape but it's colored so that you can place it on your knitting, on your pattern, and, um, and keep track of, of where you are. Uh, and it, you can actually lift it up and put it down in another place. And I find that you can do this on a chart, you can do this on the written instructions. I find it's really valuable because who's with me here? You know that you've picked, you've started projects that you fully intended to knit from start to finish and they languish, right? They go for one reason or another, go into, we've talked about this before, right? They go into a bag and who knows where you were. So it's a really good idea to can, even if you think it's a little obvious to do it, that you, oh, I know where I am, just to kind of keep marking up, I've done this row, I've done this row, here's where I am, uh, just so the, if you come back to it, 
and it's accidentally been six months since the last time you worked on it, it's a lot easier to figure out where you were. So I think that is about it for this week. I've actually gone on long enough, I do believe. Again, you can find me at darkmatternits.com. Uh, you can find the episodes on iTunes and also on my website. And uh, it would be great if you could leave any ratings or reviews of, of the podcast on iTunes. It helps people find it more easily. And um, again, I'm Elizabeth GM on Ravelry and Dark Matter Knits on Twitter. I will see you in a couple of weeks. I typically record on Fridays. This time it was just because the, uh, the retreat was happening then and I just couldn't record while I was up there. But um, I will see you a couple of Fridays from now. Take care. Bye.